So perhaps at this point, as you hear some of the differences described between our old conferences and our new conference, maybe at this point you are thinking, well, those things sound nice. Those things even sound good. But come on. I've been around here long enough to know. I've been part of the institution long enough to know. You talk a nice game, but nothing's really going to change. Well, if you are thinking those things in any way here this morning, let me just say you have every reason to think that, to feel that. That has been our experience as we have consistently lived into the insanity of decline. But we on the vision team, we in no way pretend to have all the answers. We're not even sure that we have a lot of answers. But we do believe this. We believe that with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that with your creativity, our repentance before God, that there are more answers to be found. We think that you will be interested to know of just a few of the tangible ways some of the things on a day-to-day -day basis in the lives of our local churches that will begin to feel even slightly different and hopefully eventually majorly different as we begin to re-examine new life together and reverse the downward spiral way of being that we have been involved in for so long. So as we begin to conclude our time and our report here this morning, we want to ask you to listen to a few individuals who represent us in a variety of ways on some of the tangible differences that we hope will mark this unfrozen moment that we have been given. We're going to listen specifically to five different individuals respond basically to the question of what's really going to be any different on a day-to-day -day basis for me in the life of a local church and in our new conference. And we hope that as you hear some of these responses, it will prompt within us even a slight melting of the cynicism that we so often carry. And in place of that, offer the hope of the living God. So let's share together in some of that conversation here this morning. Well, good morning to all of you. Good morning. Morning. The rest of morning. you too. Morning. Good morning. Yeah. Hey, I want you to pretend they're not even here. Who? Good answer. Vance Hart. No TV cameras, no microphones. We're just in a room. I'm just an average pastor in an average church. And I have to say that there's an awful lot of Thomas in me. Until I see the nail prints in the hands, it's just words. Like Thomas, until I see the nail prints in the hands, it's not real to me. Uh, I own my own cynicism about that as well, but I sure could use your help to get past that. Great commercial, Mike. Really, that was good. I like that. We do some really cool creative stuff talking about change. But I gotta say, until I see it, really see it, experience it, it, it has no reality to me. So Mark, what are you gonna do to help me and my church make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world in a different way than we've been doing? Over the past couple of years, the cabinet has um, really been wrestling with the role of superintending in the 21st century. We have been asking a lot of questions, and the primary one is, what must we change in the way in which we do our work? I want to be very clear, the entire cabinet, each of my colleagues, we love the United Methodist Church. We are committed to the United Methodist Church. We believe that God is calling and desires to use the United Methodist Church to increase His kingdom. But we are not interested in managing the survival or the maintenance of an institution. Our desire is to help pastors and congregations and us ourselves live and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and connect with and engage people who do not yet know what we know, the abundant life, the forgiven life, the transforming life, and the whole life that only Jesus can provide. Amen. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I can't ignore that. I, That's all right. <laughs> I, I'm glad you agree with that. We've got to recognize this, though. There is a system to manage. To say anything else would be naive and irresponsible. 
The superintendents are charged with making sure that some of the management of the system happens. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing that says superintendents have to do that management. We have to make sure it happens. But others can do it. And so we believe that we need to move away from our primary task of being managers to allowing God to use us to lead. That's why a little bit later this morning, we're going to be presenting a recommendation that reduces the number of districts. And we believe that that recommendation will help us to live out what our primary task is, and that is to equip churches to live the mission to do the most important thing, and that is make more disciples. We can't continue what we're doing now. And right now, superintendents spend way too much time on issues of ineffectiveness and issues that are not about vitality or transformation. And we want to change that. A lot of people, as they look at that plan, say, where are the details? I'm a person who likes details. Friends, we don't have all the details figured out. But we believe it's driven by mission, and we believe that it will indeed help us to accomplish the most important thing. And some of the comments I've heard as people have said, well, it's going to further distance the superintendent. Uh, small churches are never going to see the superintendent. This is not a small church, large church thing. Superintendents are going to invest their time with pastors who desire to be transformational. They're going to invest their time with churches who want to be vital. So if you're a pastor who desires to be transformational, if you're a church who desires to be vital, you're probably going to see your superintendent more than you want to. <laughs> and I think it, we need to say this too. If you're a church that does not want to be vital, if you're a pastor who isn't interested in being transformational, you might not see your superintendent as much. And I think we need to say that's okay. We've been talking to churches about the life cycle. Every organism has a life cycle. I have a life cycle. I was born and one day I'm going to die. And there's nothing I can do to change that. I can try to make that life cycle longer by the choices that I make. But I can't change the fact that I'm going to die. Organizations also have a life cycle. The difference is an organization can jump off of one life cycle onto a new life cycle. If we keep doing things the way that we are doing them, as much as I love this church, we're going to die. But we have the chance to jump the life cycle and to start again and live out the mission that God has called us to live out. And that's our commitment as the cabinet. Amen. Thank you for your response, Marcel. You and I are colleagues, the front line of ministry as food pastor in churches. Uh, we're going to get retooled, retrained, transformed. That means we're going to count things differently, aren't we? Most definitely. One of the greatest concerns that pastors have is around the year end reports. And we've heard. Oops. Okay. Hello. One of the things that pastors have had great concern about, Jim, are the year-end reports. It's a time of frustration, a time of heartache, a time of great difficulty. And, and we've heard that concern. So one of the things that will be is that there will be a different way of reporting at the end. And rather than churches focusing on being a members-making church, the focus will be on being a disciple-making yeah. church. And so pastors will have the opportunity to tell the story of how they're making disciples in the life of their ministry. And we'll be doing that through a short narrative. And so hopefully it takes the focus not on how many people there are, but how is the church making disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? Great, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna to turn to you, Mike. Okay. Uh, PC Mac World. Mm. Uh, how, how are you bringing the conference office and your ministry folk from the PC into the Mac world that now we're going to be living in with you? Right. Well, 
I think one of the, the biggest steps that we've taken as an annual conference and, and, and as a denomination, frankly, is to be very clear as to what the mission of the annual conference is, which is different than what the mission of a local church is. Local churches make disciples, conferences don't. Conferences' job are to uh, lift up and equip transformational leaders. We're called to resource local churches with the tools and ministry uh, aids that we need to make them effective in their disciple making. And as the Office of Connectional Ministries is named Connectional, we're also here to uplift this covenant we all share together as, a, a, as one large church with many, many facets and uh, many storefronts. And every church is important, and every church is a little bit different. And so the movement in Connectional Ministries uh, is to begin to resource churches who want to be resourced, who need to be resourced, uh, with, the, with the kinds of tools and uh, uh, pieces of, uh, of experiences that can help them be more effective. Things like Mission Insight, which can help us learn about who the people are in this new mission field that's right outside our doors. Many of us no longer in the church look like the community in which we, in which we are, in which we live. Mission Insight is a way to do that. Um, Pieces like, uh, well, Discovery Place, many of you use that. Our usage is way up this year with that. Providing churches resources that you don't have to go out and buy, they're there. And it's free to you uh, as, as churches to come and use that. The e-tour has been an exciting experience. The e-tour uh, came about, people said, what's the e all about? It was about four words. And we wrote them out one day and it formed the letter E and we got excited about that. Our job is to equip, empower, to engage and to connect. Those form that E. But the real message is we're going to be coming to you. We will come to every district. We will come to clusters. However we can help bring those resources closer and fit them to your needs rather than you all come events with a program that fits supposedly everyone. Great. Thank you. Nick. Uh These resources, our most valuable resources are our people, but they need tools to work with, and that usually comes from money. I know you have something to say about that. I, I say, show me the money, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I know when there's a change in my life and in my own priorities and my own discipleship that that's always reflected in some way in my checkbook. Mm -hmm. So I look to the annual conference's checkbook to see what's going to be different in the future. Uh, and those of us who serve in local churches know that about 20% of the average church's budget now goes to conference spending. Um, and that's a, that's a huge burden for many churches. Um, and you'll see that uh, our Council on Finance and Administration has made it a goal to reduce that amount from 20% to 15%. And they plan to try to do that over the next five years which means that lie ahead some difficult decisions in which ministries will continue to fund and those that we can no longer afford. Um, but this year's budget is the first step in that direction and you'll see a reduction there. Um, and we have started to ask a missional question of those receiving funds from our annual conference. We now ask, how are you going to resource the local church? And that question is central to deciding and making those difficult decisions for the future about which uh, things we will continue to fund. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for that information on the change that's gonna occur in the way we do our budgeting. Steve, I, I, or Jeff, excuse me, I noticed you're the only guy up here with the yellow tag. How's that going? It's going okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but we're, we're in a cooperative ministry. We are. We do this together. If we we're do. gonna go into our future, we go together. I know you have some neat stuff to share. Well, you know, Jim, we've heard an awful lot through this presentation. We've heard the word change. Mm -hmm. I've heard you say it. I've heard, I think every one of these panelists say change. And I've got to ask the question that I suspect's in a lot of, well, I know they're not out there. This is just to you. Yeah. It might just be in your mind, not yeah. theirs. <laughs> but I've got to ask the question, Jim. It's all talk, isn't it? How are we going to take all these ideas and all this talk and put it into action? Who's going to do it? When's it going to happen? How's it going to happen? How do we implement this change? How's that going to occur? And you know, there's one more question that's floating around in my mind, and I suspect it might be out there in a few other minds too. Why should I care? 
Why should I care at the local church level or in my own personal ministry field? Why should I care what the conference is doing? Well, I can tell you as a, a lay person on the vision leadership team that I personally struggled with all those questions, every one of them. They are valid questions that are in all likelihood floating in your mind. And I can tell you all, I think I can speak for all the vision team that we've also wrestled with those same questions. Maybe not the one about why should I care, <clears throat> but the others, yes, we have wrestled with. They're valid questions. And that's where God stepped in. Because God brought a guy to the vision leadership team by the name of John Seltenheim. John's a member of Camp Hill United Methodist Church in New Cumberland District. And in John's day job, he's a senior vice president for a division of Highmark. And what John brought to the table as a way for us to turn this talk and these ideas into action is to create what's called a strategic plan. Okay, now you've just heard that term. Jim, will you yawn with me? Strategic oh, plan, are you serious? <laughs> Many of you out there may have had experiences with strategic planning, maybe in your own church, maybe in your business, perhaps in other organizations that you serve. It is a common term. And one of the fallacies of a strategic plan is that too often what we do is we sit down and we brainstorm and we think up all these great ideas and we write them all down and we put them in nice color paper with lots of pretty pictures and guess where that goes? Up on the shelf. And it's there for a whole year until the next year comes and then we'll pull it back out, we'll dust it off and we'll update it. And then where's it go? Back on the shelf. But what John brought us from his model in the business world is a different way to go about it. One of the things in particular that he suggested to us is, look, don't take every single idea that we can all dream up and put it in this plan. That's where a lot of firms and organizations who do this fail. There's too much, too much to be done all at one time. Eight or 10 or 12 or 15 goals and you can't achieve them all with excellence in one year. So what he's urged us to do, following from what Highmark's example, is let's pick maybe four, five at most, achievable goals that we can list and show accountability. Show who's going to be responsible for it. Who's going to do it? When's it gonna happen? What's the timeline? And let's be accountable to each other with that model. There's another key to it that I see Highmark doing in, in John's model that's totally different than anything I've experienced before. And that is communication of that plan. Sure, everybody rolls out a strategic plan for the first time and presents it and say, good, that's done. Check it off the list, we're finished with that now, right? What they do at Highmark and what John's urging us to consider doing is no, at Highmark they roll it out on a quarterly basis and they put out a document that's short and concise and they send it out to all their employees across the country and say, here's where we are. Here's what we have gotten done. Here's where we're up to task. Here's where we've fallen short. We need to pick up the pace. There's names on that document for all the world to see. There's accountability. And to me, that's the beauty of what John has brought to us as a vision team. There's one last element of this planning process, Jim, that I think is really important. And that's to answer this question, why should I care? Why should I really care? What's it gonna to mean to me at the local church level or in my personal ministry? Is this really gonna help me at all, this strategic plan thing? I'm gonna to try to answer that question that yes, I think you should care. Why? Because you have input to this plan. Whether you know it or not, you've already given us on the vision team significant input. We've heard from over 300 of you in two different forums. One, a survey that we put on the website. You could pick it up through the quick link last spring. And we ask you questions. They're up on the screen right now. They may be a little hard to read, but they're very fundamental questions. And boy, did you answer them. That's why this big, fat document's in my hand. Look at the breadth and the scope of all these answers. We heard a lot from you maybe a little more than we wanted to hear from you. <laughs> we heard some things, quite frankly, that were hard for us to hear. But that's the whole point, isn't it? 
for you to tell us what you like, what you don't like, what we're doing well, what we're not doing so well. So that's been incredibly valuable. The other forum that we had was a global leadership summit at Aldersgate Church, and there were over 100 of you there who sat in small group roundtables and gave us feedback, tangible feedback. So the bottom line is, we have a plan. We've heard you loud and clear. We will continue to offer you some more surveys. Keep an eye out on the quick link. We've heard you. We have a plan in the works. It's coming. Stay tuned. So there's more to come. Absolutely. Starting to see some prints in the hands. Thank you very much. Love to continue the conversation, but I think we better get back into the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Our hope this morning as we gather and as you hear these individuals talk is that even to the smallest, smallest degree, we might begin to feel that God is not finished with us yet. I personally was unsure about being on this visioning leadership team. I've got a young family. We've got a busy church. And I did not want to waste numerous hours rehashing what has always been done. I have been so grateful to come on this team and hear the most difficult of questions asked, faced. I pray that I personally have decades of ministry left in this wonderful new conference. But that will never happen if I count on just the few people that I just saw on stage, or just the bishop, or expect the cabinet to come up with the silver bullets. It will only happen if we can trust one another and begin to hope. So this morning and later on, when you hear resolutions and our new ideas brought forth, I'm not asking us to be uncritical. I'm asking us to ask the difficult questions. But the truth is, any new idea can be reshaped in a way to be shot down. But unless we want to die, we must try new things. We must trust one another. And the truth is, maybe we will fail miserably on some things, but that's okay. God will pick us up and move us ahead again if we trust each other and have hope. So this morning, whatever that means for us here, we ask you to be involved that way. To hope again. To believe again. To trust in each other, but most of all, to trust in the power of God's Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. And if we can do that, and the first time we leave in the break here in a few minutes, and our first response isn't to tear down everything we just heard, then I believe we might have a chance. And I personally can't wait to be a part of that. And I pray, I pray that you feel the same way. And if that's the case, I can't wait for the days ahead. For they are phenomenal, God-inspired moments. And isn't it great that Pentecost is coming again?